Another one, huh? Another myth. Right? Another myth? That's where we're going. Good evening. Ah, we're going to explore another, another myth of Plato's, the Phaedrus. We've gone through the Phaedo, the Phaedrus, the Republic, and now we're into the Phaedrus. Oh, Phaedrus is very interesting because it combines vision of the afterworld in terms of the journey of the soul in respect to the upper world rather than the lower world. And it includes the function of this world, and therefore it's very significant. So we should then get a view of what it's like on two levels, because this is the journey of the soul. Let me get a piece of chalk here. So everything that is said in terms of the journey of the soul after death is equally applicable to mystical states on earth. So it's a double, it's a map, which is what we've discussed before. Therefore, the theme has a double meaning, the journey of the soul after death, And we understand the idea of after death in Plato to be that interesting state of death where the separation of the soul can take place while you're still living. Therefore, the question becomes in Plato, if he defines death as the separation of the soul from the body now as well as hereafter, what kind of a journey of the soul is it? What does it encounter and what is it like? So we can take, therefore, the journey of the soul on those double meanings, after final death and the philosophical dying. Because remember what he calls the separation of the soul from the body? He calls that true philosophy. For true philosophy is nothing other than dying, the practice of death. And that is what death is, the separation of the soul from the body. So then, he adds some theme here that he really goes into unfolds in a very interesting level, what he calls the fourth kind of madness. Madness. Now that plays a major role in the entire myth, in the entire Phaedrus, because the background theme of the Phaedrus, as undoubtedly you know, is that his friend Phaedrus is being persuaded by Lysias that when you have to make a choice between two types of people for your beloved, it's best to choose the non-lover rather than the lover, because the person who is not in love with you, therefore, can handle things very efficiently, and they're not involved emotionally, and they're a great advantage, therefore, in being indifferent to those that you love. And Socrates gets upset about this, and he says, this is terrible, because love is a madness. Love is a madness. Love inspires a madness, so the whole dialogue, therefore, is about madness. So, I have a very interesting quote I'd like to share with you. The greatest blessings comes to us through madness. And when, it's, when it is sent as a gift of the gods, and when it's sent as a gift of the gods, it is for our greatest happiness. This, of course, is Plato. 245C in the Phaedrus, as all of this is from 245 on. Then he makes a very clever distinction. All of these are madnesses. These are madnesses, you see. Prophecy is a madness. Oracular power is a madness. And the muses have a madness. Three kinds of madness. And the fourth is philosophy. They're mad. They're all mad. Now, Prophecy, to function right, there's a madness that takes over, sent by the gods as a gift. And prophecy, therefore, makes men fortunate afterwards, after the prophecy is revealed. Time then allows men to adjust to a forthcoming event, and therefore it makes them fortunate if they understand and can, can relate to that prophecy. Oracular power, 
That's very good, he said, it keeps you safe for the present and in the future. Uh, oracular power is a particular kind of uh, function. This is whenever you encounter people whose whole families seem to carry along either a particular kind of disease or fate, negative fate. He said, then you need oracular power to break through that and then reverse it. We would call that some kind of therapy in today's world. It's that keeps you safe for the present and the future, but that requires, however, a certain kind of payment. It means, therefore, person who is then relieved of that must then offer their prayers to the gods and be in service to the gods from that point on. The muses, that's another kind of madness. He says, uh, true muse is mad. Homer and Hesiod, they're mad. He says, when anyone tries to become a great poet without divine madness, he says, they're rational and never makes money. I mean, it's very clever and it's very nice, but it doesn't inspire and it doesn't illuminate. Therefore, the muses, too, have a kind of madness, and that educates later generations. Then he pulls it together and he says, prophecy is to augury. Augury, by the way, is when you're using rational signs to predict the future. Rolling the coins, Chinese coins, or dropping the tarot sticks, all of these procedures are augury, where you're trying to find some correspondence between this world and what it portends for the future by looking at signs. Ah, oh, there goes a bird. Oh, it's a sign. Oh, that's looking at visible things in the hopes that you can understand future events through them. That's augury. So augury is a particular kind of practical kind of rational prophecy. So he says, therefore, prophecy is to augury as madness from the gods it's to sanity of human origin, because the people who function on that way have to be very rational. They have to be able to look up the Book of Changes. They have to know it. They have to be able to relate to it. He said it's a kind of sanity. And he says, but the greatest of all madnesses here, he says, of the three is prophecy. And we can know the fourth kind of madness, which is philosophy. Right? Platonic philosophy is mad. What? Yeah, you can... Now look, <clears throat> he says, to talk about this fourth kind of madness, he said, you have to understand the soul. Now, for Plato, the idea of soul has two aspects. Soul, divine soul, or soul taken in general. Now, why does he do that? Look here. Wherever you see evidence of order, Balance, symmetry, right? and especially developed patterns. That's signs of intelligibility breaking through. Signs of intelligibility breaking through. But these are also the four primary categories, as you undoubtedly know, of the presence of beauty. These are aesthetic principles. Now, would you not agree you can look out in the heavens and you can see a vast order? You can go to the subatomic world and be startled by the, the supersymmetry of the subatomic world. We're facing nothing today other than more and more sophisticated patterns of order. Now, order presupposes intelligence. <clears throat> All of this presupposes some intelligence. But intelligence must be somewhere and function in some way, and therefore it must be in some sense contained, because intelligence is always contained in soul. Therefore, if there's intelligence in the universe exhibited by those four principles, then that presupposes there must be soul in general throughout the entire cosmos. This is quite interesting. This thesis is developed in Plato's Timaeus. That's his cosmology. And uh, that's what we should do one day. <clears throat> uh, his cosmology is magnificent, of course. And that's where he fully develops that theme. Now, he says, look here. 
If therefore soul in general operates through intelligence, then obviously it functions in two ways. It takes care of all that is soulless, and since the soul in general can take on many forms, it traverses the heavens throughout many forms. But when intelligence exhibits itself on the highest level, and the particular form of the soul exhibits perfection, then the soul and that intelligence can then soar. And this is where we get into the myth. When it's perfect, we say it's fully winged. Now here we get the idea of the winged, right? Now for those of you who are familiar with the soul, now there's a very beautiful soul with wings flying around. When the soul is perfect, now remember we're using soul on two levels, cosmic, the entire universe, wherever there is order and intelligence, it presupposes soul, and also individuals. Now, at this point, uh, soul in general therefore governs the whole world, and when it's fully, fully developed, fully perfected in many of its various forms, and then ascends. Now we want to know about that ascension and how it relates, relates to madness, because madness is our theme. Because of the many forms the soul can take, some are less capable of making that journey, ascending, because where it ascends is to the heavens, the higher heavens. Heavens is a word that is also Uranus, which is the god heaven, or Uranus. And therefore, they ascend to a banquet and a feast in the heavens. Now, what is this image of souls? Now, behind every one of these images in the myth, there is a content. The content is an intellectual understanding of the way in which these forms are rep re uh, represent major ideas. The wings in Plato are the consequence of being nourished and grow. There's a certain nourishment and growth that has to take place, and that takes place when one seeks and has experiences of beauty, naturally, after all, wisdom, and goodness. That's what causes the soul to develop, gain strength, so it's for its flight into the heavens. Now there's a banquet in the heavens, and therefore all of the various forms of soul, and especially the highest expression of soul in its upward flight, is Zeus. And so when the banquet is announced, Zeus and the eleven squadrons follow him, make a, a direct descent into the heavens for a banquet to be held on the highest top, as they call it, the top of the heavens. Now, as we said, the soul takes on many forms. Some are unable to take the flight. Some, therefore, are unable to reach that excellence or that banquet. And we have to understand, therefore, those that sought and those that fell. Right? The fall of the soul in the mythical world. How is that brought about? Now, remember, this is a journey after, after death. Either one of those two ideas of death is agreeable. Now, Zeus, of course, is the highest expression of soul, the divine soul. And therefore, as we have here, it's a, it, he's aloft with a winged chariot because he doesn't have wings. The chariot that he, he, uh, he rides is itself winged. And that's the highest expression of winged because the whole body that he's with, therefore, must contain nothing but beauty, wisdom, and goodness to the highest degree. But So Zeus then arranges all and cares for all. Uh, Zeus cares for all. That's providential, right? Providential. Uh, because uh, in the Greek world, of course, uh, providence is being able to see ahead, to be able to, under, to, be able to grasp the, the eternal, be able to see and to cease with such clarity that therefore that seeing can always be connected with a general goodness that develops. Therefore, it's a providential seeing. Uh, video, right, pro, pro, to see video, right, providential, to see before, right, so it's the kind of vision that comes before intellect, 
higher than intellect and always attains a certain uh, insight into the nature of goodness. And that's Zeus. That's how Zeus is described. So with the 12 squadrons, they run up to the heavens. And as they run up to the top of the heavens, which in the myth is called the vault of heaven, they then, as you can see in this beautiful picture, there they are in the vault of heaven. And they journey all the way up. And, uh, of course, I have them sitting there because it's easier to draw that way. They then reach the outer surface of the heavens and all of those souls that are able to make that journey. And therefore, they can then have a splendid vision of the outer or the, uh, what's beyond the heavens, which in Plato, of course, is pure being. And that pure being already has three aspects of it, which we'll get into quickly. Right? And the three aspects, of course, are uh, when the soul is there for on the, uh, on the outer surface of the heavens and they, the whole thing revolves around and it's revolving around, they're able to perceive justice, uh, temperance, and uh, knowledge. Oh, that's incorrect. Judge of knowledge. All right. So what do they encounter there? They have a vision of justice, right, truth, right, and knowledge. Now what kind of knowledge is this that's gained? It is the highest expression of knowledge. And uh, we'll take a little bit of time on that. Um, the, um, one, of the, one of the highest aspects of being is in the Greek the idea of usia. Now, why use a Greek word? Because it has a use which is not current in English. That's the only reason. Now, this word is variously translated as essence and substance and being. But the reason I'd like to keep that use is because at the very core of reality and pure being, it is not a dead thing. It's not only luminous, but it has a profound Re recursive property through it turns upon itself and therefore that, that being is recursive, turning upon itself, seeing itself uh, in an intellectual vision where the intellect is seeing intelligently the intelligible, that's usia. So recursive turns upon itself, sees itself, sees itself. Now, what does it encounter? Various translations of it, a colorless, formless, intangible, truly existing essence. Well, they're all negatives. Colorless, formless, intangible, these are all negatives. Uh, dia negativa, you know, it's all the negatives. But it's truly existing essence, and that word, of course, is arusia. That's the true object of knowledge in Plato. That's what it's all about. Now, uh, that is perceived. That's what the whole struggle is for, is to be able to perceive that and to be able to see it in depth and in permeate one's being, because one's being is reality, and therefore one sees in this way, one sees the nature of reality as oneself, and oneself is the nature of reality. That has to be a turning around. By necessity, it has to be a turning around. Now, what's interesting now is that what do you gain from that? Of course, you get the great things, happiness, and that's the very activity where the mind is nourished for its splendid vision so it can retain that vision and stay in that state. And therefore, this revolution that they talk about in the Phaedrus, right, those that can maintain that vision, can therefore persist in that state for a thousand years, and those that can stay there three times in a row, right, get the golden ring. And um, 
they are free from the next free from harm for the next period and go on on their own way. Now what that means is not clear, um, which we mentioned before in the other dialogues. Uh, free to go, right? Free to go on their own. Now those that do not reach this then are reborn. And therefore, reincarnation comes through, and it goes through nine categories. And uh, it's interesting categories, and I'd like to read you the nine categories. Um, let me do that now. Can you go back to the previous page? Was yeah. there something there that we missed? Could be. What? Uh, I can turn it back. Yeah, yeah. 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 I thought maybe you'd remember it. No. All right, all right, all right, all right, yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Think something of it? I could, so, so keep a watchful eye. I've been known to do that. It seems to a Western mind, this is a much more interesting concept of nirvana to be free to go on your own way than just yeah. disappearing. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know what he means by it, of course. Right, but, but it's certainly, say, it's certainly it's interesting. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know? yeah. It's better than nirvana blowing out the flame. Yeah. It's saying something, right, right? It's so free to go on their own. <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me read to the. Uh, it's quite interesting because the. The uh, different categories are. Uh, Can you sure, 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 sure. <coughs> um, I'm at 248 uh, D. Now, the whole question that we want to explore later is how do you account for the fall? How do you account for the fall? That's what we must see. So first he'll talk about it in general terms, then he'll, he'll uh, give us some very interesting particulars about it. But when through an inability to follow, it fails to see, and through some mischance is filled with forgetfulness, now that mischance we want to see later, and is filled with forgetfulness and evil and grows heavy, and when it has grown heavy, loses its wings and falls to the earth, then it's the law that this soul shall never pass into any beast at its first birth, but the soul that has seen the most shall enter into the birth of a man who is to be a philosopher or lover of beauty. And I dare say there isn't anybody in this room who's not a lover of beauty, right? Or one who is musical or a loving nature. They fit together, it's one category. And the second soul into that of a lawful king, warlike ruler, third, into that of a politician, or a man of business, financier, fourth, into a hard working gymnast, or one who will be concerned with the cure of the body. Fifth, Ah, oh, the fifth will lead the life of a prophet or someone who conducts mystical, mystic rites, the sixth, the poet, or some other imitative artist will be united. Then to the seventh, craftsman, husbandman, eighth, sophist, demagogue, then a tyrant, the last. Now, oh. Let us get into this curious, this very curious Platonic idea, and uh, uh, what is he saying? Let me read you where we're going now. Then a human soul may pass into the life of a beast, and a soul which has, was once human may pass again from beast to a man. For the soul which has never seen the truth can never pass into human form. Here we are now. For a human being must understand a general conception 
formed by collecting into a unity by means of reason the many perceptions of the senses. And this is a recollection of those things which our soul once beheld when it journeyed with God and lifting its vision above the things which we now say exist rose up into real being. And therefore it's just that the mind of the philosopher only has wings for he is always so far as able to communicate. To communicate. Right. I like this sentence. Let me do it again. And therefore it is just that the mind of the philosopher only has wings, for he is always, so far as he is able, in communion through memory, which those things, the communion with which causes God to be divine. Now a man who employs such memories rightly is always being initiated into perfect mysteries, and he alone becomes truly perfect since he separates himself from human interest and turns his attention towards the divine, <laughs> he's rebuked, re rebuked by the vulgar who consider him mad. Now this is the fourth kind of madness. Now let's see what kinds of things he's talking about. That's what we want to say. Um, and he gives some examples. So let me do it with you. All right? <clears throat> Here we go. Now, this may seem like a tangent, but hold to it for a few minutes. Um, this requires you now to recall of all the things that you've ever experienced where you'd be willing to say you encountered beauty. All right, consider it. Two things now. Don't just think of the object. Keep in mind the state it put you into, the state of mind it brought you to. Mm -hmm. Again. Um, can you think of some times when through any kind of turmoil, any kind at all, you were able to, to whatever degree now, able to keep cool? Why? Think of it now, come on. Let the event, the object now recede and go again to the state of mind. All right, can you describe that state of mind? Describe that state of mind. I want to use another word now. <clears throat> We don't use it too much, but I, I think it's worthwhile. Um, is there some sense in which you can say you experienced in some way a sense of righteousness? No. Oh, that's a small r. No, no, not righteousness with some honorific sense, but the sense in which everything was just proper the way they were. Everything was, see, our use of the word justice doesn't capture what I want because that has a legal aspect of it and I want to drop that out. I can think of some event where you'd say, by heavens, that was an encounter of righteousness. You did something. Hey, it was right to have done it. Right? You can look back on it look back on it. You can recall it. You can consider it. You can say, yeah, that was as much as possible, right? Ah, let the object slip back, go for the state of mind.
Okay, now here's where you have to bring, all right? You have three states we talked about. Right. Now, I need one more. This may be a little hard to capture, but try it, all right? I'm going to move from righteousness to goodness. All right. It's adding another level to righteousness. You know, it was good. Right? It had goodness. The quality of goodness was present. We have four scenes, don't we? Now look here. What I'd like you to do is to see whether you can now consider these four states of mind and gather them together uh, can they come together because there's going to be a certain degree of overlap as states of mind can you pull them together consider it See, because you did have a perception of these objects, each one was an object of your experience, therefore it's something you experience through the senses, right? And now I'm asking you to gather them together to see whether you can pull them into a unity. We're talking about an interesting state of mind. Okay? All right. Now look. Somehow you were able to experience these states of mind through these events by bringing yourself into it with a certain kind of internal integrity. That's what, you're, that's what you did. Now it's difficult defining what these things are. And by the way, this uh, traditionally is called uh, temperance, but no one uses that word anymore. But the root meaning of it, as you know, is uh, sound mind, keeping your cool. Now, would you be willing to go further and say that it's possible to experience these objects to a greater degree? That is to say, you're able to participate in them more fully, you're able to allow yourself to be present in a more integral way, a more sense of kind of that wonderful thing, that inner integrity, right? You can do it. Does it admit of degrees? If so, what would it be like to expand this state to allow it to emerge more fully? That's what I want. Now, what Plato is doing in the Phaedrus, going back now into the Phaedrus, <coughs> is he is saying that here we are on earth, and these things that are encountered in the heavens, and what he calls pure being, justice, truth, knowledge, he said, we get glimpses of that. We get glimpses of that here. But it's very difficult to see it through the organs of the senses. We have to use our mind to see it. That's what you're now doing. You're exercising your mind to see whether you can pull together all of these different states of mind that you experienced into a unity. And I'm in 
encouraging you to kind of consider it so that it's now open to you and you can allow yourself perhaps to experience it more fully, at least to consider that as a possibility. Now, what does that mean? That means then for Plato and the myth and the Phaedrus, by practicing only one thing, which is in these experiences, which we all have to every single day of our lives, to various degrees, it always, right? Forget the object that you encounter through the senses. Go to, go to the state of mind that you're experiencing. What is that pulling it all together? Because he is saying that it's very difficult to get a clear idea of what that is here. Because all of our concern is to describe the thing. We want to describe the thing. We want to say, what was the thing that was so beautiful? Okay, drop that. Go for this. He's over here. We're over here. We want to recall this. No, he's saying, no, you recall this. Because when you're doing that, then you're getting practice. You're getting practice because that's what was experienced here when we were journeying with the gods to the degree that we were able to perceive it. Let's see if I can give you that now back into this quote. Back into the faders now. It's not easy. Right? Oh, let me back up. I'm at uh, 249E. For, as has been said, every soul of man has by the law of nature beheld the realities. Otherwise, it would not have entered into a human being. But it's not easy for all souls to gain from earthly things a recollection of those realities, either for those which had but a brief view of them at the earlier time, or for those which after falling to earth were so unfortunate as to be turned towards unrighteousness through some <coughs> evil communication, and to have forgotten the holy sights which they once saw. What's the reason we turn away from him? Evil communications. That's what he says. Hey, look here. Uh, the word evil, of course, isn't there. It's bad communication. Right? He's going to say this is the real problem, that we pick up certain attitudes and certain beliefs, and it's these beliefs that inhibit us from experiencing this more fully. We get caught here into things. Or we get into considering other things more important than these experiences. So let me jump in back into the text. Few then are left which retain an adequate recollection of them. But these, now, now we're going back on earth now, but these who can recall those past scenes, when they see any likeness of the things of that other world are stricken with amazement and can no longer control themselves. And they don't understand their condition because they do not clearly perceive. Now in the earthly copies, in the earthly copies of justice, temperance, and these other ideals, which are precious to souls there, there is no light, but only a few approaching the images through the darkling organs of the sense behold in them the nature of that which they imitate. And they do this with difficulty. Right. That's what we're getting now. See, I'm trying to bring you into it. Right. Because when I'm addressing into this, when I'm addressing this to you, right, but only a few approaching the images, these are images of these things, each one of the things you regard as beautiful, each of the occasions of keeping your cool of righteousness or goodness. They're imitations of a pure, of the pure form. And therefore we have difficulty grasping them. But in former times, they saw with beauty, shining and brightness, when with a blessed company we followed in the train of Zeus or others. 
Now, uh, I should mention that um, the 11 orders of the gods, there are 12, Zeus is one, but the 11 others, each one is a god, and therefore each person after their death is going to pursue the ideal which they have been pursuing in life. Therefore, people may follow Apollo, and they may follow Ares if they're warlike. These are all archetypes. You follow your archetype, whatever archetype you've been introduced to and you find akin to, that's the one you're going to follow in the uh, afterworld in the next experience. And each one of these can lead you to a certain height, but the Zeus, which is the highest, of course, leads most directly and swiftly up into the higher realities. Um, but at that former time they saw beauty shining in brightness when with a blessed company we following in the train of Zeus and others of some other god they saw the blessed sight and vision and were initiated into what is rightly called the most blessed of mysteries which we celebrated in a state of perfection when we were without experience of the evils which awaited us at the time Right. Okay, what do we then? We become initiates, initi initiates to the sight of perfect and simple and calm and happy apparitions, which we saw in the pure light, being ourselves pure and not entombed, which is what he calls the body. So, this, this is an initiation into what he calls the mysteries. To practice this, this is a recollection, to bring this together into a unity, to that is the very initiation into the mysteries, because in their few pure form, remember that very loaded expression we had a moment ago? That's a very magnificent one, which I enjoy reading. So let me go back and pull it together now. For a human being must understand a general conception, this one, formed by collecting into a unity by means of reason the many perceptions of the senses. And this is a recollection of those things which our soul once beheld when it journeyed with God and lifting its vision above the things which we now say exist rose up into real being. Here's the great expression now. And therefore it is just that the mind of the philosopher only has wings, for he is always, as far as he is able, in communion, in communion, through memory, see, you're recalling this, in communion, through memory, with those things, the communion with which causes God to be divine. This is the cause in its purest form of God being divine. Watch now, okay? Let's see whether we can have some fun, all right? As you thought of these states of mind, can you tell me what kinds of words you use to describe that? Meditation. That's true, that's the process. All right, let, well, let, here. More. Elevated. Elevated. Elevated, nice, elevated. Brilliant, bright light. Clear. Penetrating everything. <laughs> Non-moving. Absolute. A stillness? A stillness? A stillness, yes. A stillness? Calm, still. More? Peak experience. Pardon? Peak experience. Sure. Right, this is a peak experience. Eagle, this. Mm. Negatives, right? Egoless. Because if, it's, if it comes up, it diminishes this. You're quite right. Yeah, it's quite right. right. Effortless. I always like that one myself. <laughs> one more step now already. Oh, and now if you have some, yes, you have a couple of more favorites. Profound silence. A profound silence. I can sneak that in there somewhere. <laughs> Blissfulness. All right, now look, 
Too many terms. <coughs> Too many terms. <coughs> Got to collapse them a little bit. All right, okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, now we're going to... So we have to collect into a unity. That's what he told us to do in the text, collect into a unity. So we have to pull these more into a unity. Um, being in that state, um, I imagine we could describe it negatively. It's not this, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this, many, many negatives. But um, certainly, it's intangible. It's also unity. I mean, the easy yeah, yeah, yeah. unity. No duality. So no, no duality. No duality. No duality. Calm, stillness, non-moving, clear, brilliant, profound silence, elevated, empty. So, how does this relate? How does this relate to one word? It's almost a feeling of separate from the body. Kind of a separation of the body. And therefore, you're left then with the presence of this without ego. Is that right, sir, back row? Yes. All right, then we can be firm and go ahead. Now look, let's go back over here. These are negatives. Certainly colorless, formless, intangible. See, these words, truly existing essence. Now we want to say, when you're in that state, um, what are you aware of? Mind? What are you aware of? What, what is this stuff? What is this? Certainly you'd agree um, it's not boring. Right? It's not boring. It's not dull. Here's the problem, see. Is this, is this a glimpse of this? Because this is really saying, as we mentioned before, you see, this is mind, right? Not turning on anything other than itself. This isn't turning on anything other than itself. Therefore, by Reflecting on this and pulling it together into a unity, you're initiating yourself into the mysteries, and this is the mystery, that the nature of reality is truly existing essence, or in Greek, usia. Now, um, That collecting together then, it's like you mentioned a moment ago, it's a contemplation, it's a meditation, it's bringing you into mindfulness, and this then brings us into a more profound way of being out of our own experience. Now, um, yes, please. This is the first time I am attending, so if I sound... Oh, uh, all these adjectives that you use, to me, they denote a sense of beauty, blissfulness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which has forms for me, yes. which has color for me. Yes. But you related that to colorless. That's the object. Oh, oh okay. The That's effect the it has on you. Mm. All right. All right. Mike, try something. Consider the state of mind encountering beauty. How about unexpectedly? Wow. Right. Uh, how is that similar or different from uh, considering this possibility? Uh, 
much to your surprise, one day you discover that an old dear friend of yours suddenly shows up and you never expected it, and they just pop up right in the middle of a group or walking around a corner around some street. There they are. What's that like? And now, here, not here, see, not in the object. What effect does it have? Now, don't use any terms that you would normally use to describe an experience of beauty. Because they must be different, mustn't M Must they? Could they? Might they? Okay. Sudden? But the Beauty? State, sudden? But the state of mind mm -hmm. is dependent upon the object, what kind of experience you had with that individual that you knew before. Yes, that's why I chose it. Yeah, yeah that's right. But, uh, that's right, you want to heighten this, but then we're talking about the effect, the state of mind. This is what we want to pull together into a unity. So the point I was going to try to show is that if you take the state of mind of beauty, just beauty in itself, how is that different from recognition? Right? Right? Both there's recognition, aren't there? Right? Aren't they? Recognition, surprise, wonder, surprise, astonishment, delicious surprise, all of those words. Now look what he says it does. This is a curious now. He thinks this can be cultivated. This can be cultivated. These experiences can be cultivated. Now, um, Now, when he does this, he, well, he typically, Plato typically does this, and it's really, really a wonderful device. When he wants to now talk about that state, <clears throat> he's going to first describe <coughs> the same state on the highest level. That's what he's going to do. And then he's going to contrast it with our everyday world. So, <clears throat> uh, he gives us a glimpse of this when he says, look here, I've got to tell you about the difference between the nature of reality and our everyday world. Now, when he does that, he wants to pick on the idea of uh, beauty, brilliance, shining, wisdom. See. We want to now, see, we're looking at this, and now he's going to introduce this, <clears throat> this word. And now, <clears throat> beauty, radiance, luminosity, we're going to need a whole bunch of words, and madness. That's how he does it. And at uh, 250. So much then in honor of memory, on account of which I have now spoken at some length, through yearning for the joys of that other time. But beauty, as I said before, shone in brilliance among those visions. And since we came to earth, we have found it shining most clearly through the clearest of the senses, of our senses. For sight is the sharpest of the physical senses. Though wisdom is not seen by it, for wisdom would arouse terrible love if such a clear image of it were granted as could come through sight. And the same is true of the other lovely realities. But beauty alone has this privilege, and therefore it is most clearly seen and loveliest. And so he's going to pick that one. That's what he's talking about. Now he's going to shift back to this. Now, I'm just skipping a, a couple of sentences. I'm going back here into the idea of initiation, which is where we were working. But he who was newly initiated, 
was beheld many of the realities when he sees a godlike face or form, which is a good image of beauty. Now, the effect. Watch the effect now. Shudders at first. Something of the old awe comes over him. Then as he gazes, he reveres the beautiful one as a god. And if he did not fear to be thought stark mad, he would offer sacrifice to his beloved as, a, as an idol or a god. And as he looks upon him, a reaction from his shuddering comes over him, sweat, unwanted heat. For as the uh, effluence of beauty enters him through the eyes, he's warmed. The effluence moistens the germ of the feathers. And as he grows warm, the parts from which the feathers grow, which were before hard and choked and prevented the feathers from sprouting, become soft. And as the nourishment streams upon him, the quills of the feathers swell and begin to grow from the roots over all the form of the soul, for it was once all feathered. Now in this process, the whole soul throbs, palpitates, as in those who are cutting teeth here, as an irritation, as comfort in the gums when the teeth begin to grow, just so the soul suffers when the growth of the feathers begins. It is feverish and uncomfortable and itches away when they begin to grow. And when it gazes upon the beauty of a boy and receives the particles which flow f hence to it, for which reason they're called yearning, it is moistened, warmed, ceases from its pain, and is filled with joy. But when alone, it grows dry. The mouths of the passage in which the feathers begin to sprout become dry, close up. Shutting and the sprouting of the feathers sprouts within, shut. Throb like pulsing arteries. Each sprout picks, pricks the, the passage in which it is, so that the whole soul, stung in every part, rages with pain. And then again, remembering the beautiful one, it rejoices. So because of these two mingled sensations, opposites, it's greatly troubled by its state and condition. It's perplexed, it's maddened, and in its madness it cannot sleep at night and stay in any one place by day, but is filled with longing and hastens whatever it hopes to see the beautiful one. And when it sees him and is bathed by the waters and the yearning of the passages that were sealed or open, the soul has respite from the stings and is eased with pain and this pleasure which it enjoys is the sweetest of pleasures at that time. That's why he's describing the experience of beauty. He says, stay there, stay in this state. Stay in this state. Let it cultivate. Don't move on. Cultivate the state. That's what causes the wings of the soul to become nourished and the feathers to grow, but the soul is all feathered. He says, all right, the whole thing. Allow it to happen. Cultivate it. Don't turn it off. Stay in that state. And now he goes back to the lovers. And you may believe this or not, I'm jumped. But the condition of lovers and the cause of it are just as I have said. And now he's going to talk about the dynamics of love in this hierarchy. And this is what he's going to do. Right? Consider each one of the gods as an archetype. Pure form, archetype. Consider the triangle. The whole the whole procedure in the Phaedrus myth is that each person has a particular archetype to which they're attracted. And uh, as you know, all the different gods is a different expression of an archetype. 
So he says, that to understand the nature of love, he said, you have to realize that this is what you really are pursuing as you see it's visible here. You're drawn towards it. He says, look here. What you have to do is get closer and closer. You're going to want to have the relationship which is an, a, a process, it's a, a mature relationship, it's a process where all of the key attributes of the archetype are brought into the relationship and guide the relationship. And in that way, the love then becomes for both parties, they're both trying to become like the archetype, they then become a union with the archetype. That's the point. The distance closes. Now, uh, just a, a couple of pages, I think I can jump in here. Now, he who's a follower of Zeus, when seized by love, can bear a heavier burden of the winged god. But those who are servants of Ares and followed in his train, when they have been seized by love and think they have been wronged in any way by the beloved, they become murderous and ready to sacrifice themselves and the beloved. And so it is with the follower of each of the other gods. He lives as far as he is able, honoring and imitating that God, so long as he is uncorrupted and is living his first life on earth. And in that way he behaves and conducts himself towards his beloved and towards all others. Now, each one chooses his love from the ranks of the beautiful according to his character. And he fashions him and adorns him like a statue as though he were his God, to honor and worship him. The followers of Zeus desire that the soul of him whom they love be like Zeus. And so they seek for one of philosophical and lordly nature. And when they find him and love, love him, they do all they can to give him such a character. If they have not previously had experience, archetype, they learn then, from all who can teach them anything, they seek after, after information themselves. And when they search eagerly within themselves to find the nature of their God, they are successful because they have been, com they have been compelled to keep their eyes fixed upon the God. And as they reach and grasp him by memory, they're inspired and receive from him the character, habits, and so far as it is possible for a man to have a part in God. By imitating the God themselves and by persuasion and education, they lead the beloved to the conduct and the nature of the God insofar as they can do so. They endeavor by every means in their power to lead him to the likeness of the God whom they honored. Thus the desire of the true lovers and the initiation into the mysteries of love which they teach, if they accomplish what they desire in the way I've described, is beautiful and brings happiness from the inspired lover to the beloved one. If he is captured. Right? You have to be able to capture that person. Right? And therefore, there's a whole discussion now on if the character, if the character of the person you're pursuing fits the archetype and your own archetype, then the question is then how do you find a way to capture the beloved? Right, how do you capture? And this is a great section of 253. 254. And if he be captured, and the uh, beautiful one is captured, right, is caught in the following manner. And now we have a whole way of how to capture. Now, 
So to capture, now these states are intensified, these states are intensified, and now it's going to take some kind of relating with someone who exhibits all of these qualities that put you in such a state. Therefore, the image that he uses to explore this is that there is a power, a desire to capture, and with it, a desire to be satisfied, right? To satiate, to satisfy. And his whole game is to say, look here, hold back. Hold back on this, hold back on this, because that may diminish this. That's going to diminish the experience <coughs> itself. Hold back on this until you educate yourself. It's not that you turn off this. It's that this is sometimes called the, these are the two horses, and you are, of course, the charioteer. This is the dark horse. It's sometimes called the ignoble one. It's not a good and evil game. It's not a good and evil game because the dark horse has to then be educated to approach the beloved. That's it. That's the basic thing. How to approach it, how to respect it, how to relate to it on the highest level so that this and this then becomes close and this by educating uh, his own drives then can bring himself closer. The beloved then is, becomes closer and they all become a closer unity. The way he describes it is, of course, very beautiful. Um, let me jump to 254. When the charioteer, now he slips into mythology to talk about this because the, the, the mythology is able to capture the dynamics. Now when the charioteer beholds a love-inspiring vision and his whole soul is warmed by the sight and he's full of tickling and pricklings of yearnings and the the horse that is obedient to the charioteer is constrained then and always by modesty. He controls himself and doesn't leap upon the beloved, but the other no longer heeds the pricks of the whip of the charioteer, but springs wildly forward, causing all possible trouble to his mate and to the charioteer by forcing them to approach the beloved and propose the joys of love. And they at first pull back indignantly they won't be forced to do what is terrible and unlawful, but finally the trouble has no end and they go forward. Agreeing to do the bidding. Now he has the confrontation and the reflection. He is going to see if he can maintain this state with greater degree of intensity as it's now exhibited in a person who is then going to function in this triangle. And that's going to take care, that's going to take a bit of careful managing. And uh, he's got page after page of this struggle. And um, and finally, by, by slowly calming down the other side in the presence of that which they most desire. There is the transformation, and let me just get there and skip the struggle. Um, now the beloved, receiving all service from the lover, as if he were a god, since the lover is not feigning, but is really in love, and since the beloved himself is by nature friendly to him who serves him, although he may at some earlier time have been prejudiced by his schoolfellows or others, who said that it was a disgrace to yield to a lover, and may for that reason have repulsed his lover, yet as time goes on, his, his youth and destiny cause him to admit him to his society. For it is the law of fate, Adrastia, that evil can never be a friend to evil, and that the good must always be a friend to good. And when the lover is thus admitted, and the privilege of conversation and intimacy has been granted him, his goodwill, as it shows itself in close intimacy and astonishes the beloved who discovers that the friendship of all his other friends and relatives is as nothing when compared with that inspired lover. And as the intimacy continues and the lover becomes near, 
right? And touches the beloved in the gymnasium and in their general intercourse, then the fountain of that stream which Zeus, when he was in love with Ganymede called desire, flows copiously upon the lover. Some of it flows into him and some when it's when he's filled, overflows outside just as the wind or, or an echo rebounds from smooth and hard surfaces, returns whence it came. So the stream of beauty passes back into the, into the beautiful one through the eyes, the natural inlet of the soul, where it reanimates the passages of the feathers, waters them, makes their feathers to grow, filling the soul of the, of the loved one with love. And so, love. He knows not with whom, doesn't understand his condition, can't explain it. Like one who's caught a disease in the eyes for another, he can give no reason for it. But he sees himself in the lover as in a mirror, but is not conscious of the fact. Because the similarities are so great, he sees the other in himself. And the lover's presence, like him, he ceases from his pain and in his absence, like him, He's filled with yearning, which he, uh, which he inspires, and, and love's image, requited love, dwells with him. Skipping like the lover, the less strongly he desires to see the friend, touch, kiss, and lie down with him, and naturally these things are soon brought about. Now, as they lie together, the unruly horse of the lover has something to say to the charioteer and demands a little enjoyment in return for the many troubles. And the unruly horse of the beloved says nothing but teeming with passion and confused emotions. He embraces and kisses his lover and caresses him as his best friend. And when they lie together, he would not refuse a lover any favor if he asked for it. But the other horse and the charioteer oppose all this with modesty and reason. Now the better elements of the mind which lead to a well-ordered life and philosophy prevail, then life of happiness and harmony here on earth. Self-control, orderly, holding in subjection that which causes uh, bad or evil in the soul and giving freedom to that which makes for excellence. And when this life is ended, they're light and winged. They've conquered in one of the three Olympic contests, neither human wisdom nor nor divine inspiration confer upon man any greater blessing than this. If, however, they live a life less ignoble, right, less noble and without philosophy, then certain other things follow. So, that's the way he constructs the myth. That's how he brings the two, right, the way we started. We said he's going to bring in the myth on two levels, a journey of the soul on one side, and he's going to bring in the earthly side together. So you can take the story on both levels. And that's the way he constructs the myth. I've skipped several parts because of the time, but I hope certainly that we can go back to it some other time. It's a great myth. Um, and I did want to have a chance so you could throw open some questions and perhaps I can read some more. Okay. Was this for the firstborn soul? Pardon me? Was this for the firstborn? There was a mention. Yes. See, because was it a myth uh, where you come back, if you're going mm -hmm. to incarnate, mm -hmm. right. kind of you choose the ones who, mm -hmm. within the yeah. limitations yeah. of your mm -hmm. past karma, That's you right. choose where you're going to come back. So That's right. would you, under those circumstances, choose for one your archetype that you're going to follow and the type of the beloved, etc.? Yeah, there are nine orders. Right. Right? Nine orders of reincarnation. Right. And therefore, if, is your point, if you are not among the first, if you're among the first, remember that's going to be the philosopher, the lover of beauty, all right? Uh, and would you then also choose the archetype you're going to follow? Yes, yes, that's Zeus. Yeah, that's Zeus. That's right. Yeah, that's the leading one, Zeus. Uh, uh, another question. It seems, you know, again, we think let's say war is always evil, whereas it seems that you can follow ours correctly yeah. or incorrectly. Oh, yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's right, that's what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. We can be uh, an Arjuna, right? Or you can be a fool in the battle. <laughs> yeah. Um, right where you were reading, <coughs> Just right where you ended, says, and when this life is ended, they are light and winged. 
for they have conquered in one of the three truly Olympic contests. Is that light in the sense of not having much weight or light in the sense of luminosity? Um, and uh, the image here is that um, that this is a using the mind in this way right, is a separation. And the separation of the body is being light, becoming light. Yeah. Or did you mean L-I-G-H-T? That's the question. Which light is it? To? Yeah, which one is it? Well, in this game, it's the same. Okay. You become light and the, and the vision is the uh, divine luminosity. So. Oh, yeah, that's... Yeah. Well, I was wondering if it was like becoming light in the sense of like losing pounds. No, I don't know about whether it's your weight control. Yeah. No, but in the Greek, which yeah. word is, is he using in the Greek? I don't know about that. We'll have a new book out. <laughs> right? How to lose weight with Plato. <laughs> I can't wait for it to come out. And then another thing. Yes. Um, something about either the gods leading into higher realities or Zeus, Zeus yeah. himself leading into higher realities. That reminds me of the, uh, the last battle by... C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia, mm. when Aslan mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. taking them through all the, the different new Narnias, and it's like continued endlessly, mm -hmm. and like, it mm -hmm. gets brighter and more brilliant. That's true. And then That's the true. guy at the end says, uh, it's all in Plato. It's all in Plato. 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 Laughing. <laughs> <laughs> right, they're all laughing, hey, it's all in Plato. Yeah, yeah they say he's, uh, he's inspired by Christianity, but it doesn't make sense in terms of Chronicles of Narnia, does it? That's right. Yeah, Lewis, yeah. But, yeah, that's a great conclusion to the Tales of Narnia. It really is. Have you yeah. read that, Shavala? Just part of it. You should sure read The Last Battle. <laughs> the English have a, a BBC production of it. I've seen On video. All of them. And uh, it's, they don't have all of them, but uh, I think they have three of them. Four of them. All right, thank you very much. I enjoyed going through it. One for Plato.